we're so glad that you're here this morning. Why don't you stand as we praise and worship God together? i 
continue to sing about how great our God is. You give light, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore. Heavenly Father, you are great. You give us everything that we need. Through Christ's resurrection on the cross and the fact that he rose on the third day, you gave us a savior. You gave us the person, the only way, the truth and the life to being with you forever. 
to connecting with you on a daily basis and to being with you in heaven if we just believe. Lord, we thank you for that. We thank you for the firm foundation that you give through our life, that no matter what happens, you're always there for us. Whatever struggle or trial we go through, you are there. Lord, we thank you for that. We ask you to bless every person in this room. Bless this message. Bless this place. And we just love you so much. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may have a seat. Good morning, River Hills. Welcome to the perfect church. We're grateful for your presence here today. Before we jump into the message, if you would please grab one of those tickets on the seat back there beside you and uh, get it in your hand and take a look at it. And you will see that Summer at the Movies is coming up. Uh, it starts actually next week. Here are the four films that we're going to be using to teach the Bible. And this is the 23rd year for Summer at the Movies. Can you believe that? Yeah, I mean, 23 years. And uh, we were the first church in the city to do this kind of teaching series. We're certainly not the first in the country, but we were very definitely one of the first in the country, and people keep asking for it. You can see the films here. They're, they're all great uh, stories. I think you'll like them. But most of all, what we're going to do is use these films to be a bridge between culture and the Word of God to teach and instruct our lives. And week two of this series, July 9th, I'm going to be teaching on a man called Otto. Anybody seen this film yet? I mean, I uh, watch this many times now. I was watching it on the airplane flying down to uh, my mission work in Florida, and I'm crying on the, in the seat, you know, watching this film. Every time I watch it, I cry. Now, why? Because it's, it's just so real. Uh, it deals with real-life issues, with uh, resentment, with anxiety, with depression, with grief, with loss. Uh, and uh, heads up, it is um, dealing with some significant issues about suicide uh, risk there. So just be alert. But it's a great story. But all these stories I think you'll enjoy. And uh, the reason we have these tickets out We've already had people call in the office saying, are you doing summer at the movies this year? They go to other churches, but they come here for that series. So this is a great opportunity to invite friends. Also, I want to encourage you to mark July 24 to 27 for our VBS coming up. My grandson signed up last week. I watched him sign up to be part of this. You can sign up to help as well. We always are in need of uh, great workers, and that's who you are. In fact, I want you to know how much you really matter. River Hills is what it is because of you, because we are River Hills. And for us to reach our full potential, for us to have our maximum impact, we need you. No one can do everything, but everyone can do something. Would you agree with that? We can all make a difference. We can all serve. In fact, here's what I've learned. If everybody will do a little, we can accomplish a lot. Isn't that true? If everybody will do a little, we can accomplish a lot. So we're challenging you. Matt did a great job last week asking you to think about how has God shaped you to serve. And I hope you're exploring that. We want to help you with that. You can sign up for serve opportunities out in the lobby today. 
But here's the challenge. The Holy Spirit has gifted and equipped every one of us to make a difference. And if we all do a little, together we will accomplish a lot. And you can make a huge difference with your unique contribution. Well, welcome to week four of I Love My Church. And can I tell you, I love you. And I really do. I love you. I hope you know that. I wish I could love you better. If I have any regret in my life, it's that I don't love as well as I want to. I want to love God, and I want to love people really well. And I love to be part of this church because it has helped me. You've helped me to be a better lover of God, a better lover of people. Now, I love my church. You you remember where we started? I I love my church because my church has a heart for people. River Hills is really all about love. The kingdom of God is about love. It starts with loving God. It doesn't end there. It goes on to loving people. And so I love River Hills because we really do love one another. Do we do it perfectly? Of course not. But do we do it? Yes, we do. And then Matt took us into the God's call for community. We are better together. So when we come together, we benefit from one another. We learn from one another. We encourage one another. And then last week, again, Matt challenged us to serve and to use God's heart to make a difference in our, in our family, in our community, our neighborhood, our world, and, and even right here when we gather together from time to time. And today we want to wrap up this series. I love my church because my church has a heart for the future. What? What are you talking about, Jeff? A heart for the future? Well, I love my church. Because, uh, let, me, let me explain it this way. I drew my first breath on God's green earth in a little town called Foster, Kentucky. And I learned something in Foster, Kentucky. I learned that in Foster, Kentucky, I could not get away with anything. Because as a kid growing up in this little town, every woman was my mother. Every eyes were wa- a set of eyes, were, they were watching me. In fact, in this little town, people loved and cared for kids. We were kind of free-range kids. In other words, we didn't have a lot of boundaries, but we had a lot of guardians that I didn't even recognize until later. People who had their eye out for us. You see, that town, believe it or not, invested in kids in a very significant and real way. I was encouraged deeply, not only by my parents, but by people around me. And it was pretty amazing. So when I talk about my church having a heart for the future, what I'm talking about is my church having a heart for the next generation of people that are in line behind us. I love my church because my church is all in for next gen. Our church loves kids. Our church loves young people. Our church is investing in our future because it's investing in the next generation. Now, if you are somewhere between uh, being born and being born in 2012, is anybody in this room born, uh, you know, between 1995 and 2012, let's say? Okay. So I, I see a couple of hands. Thank you. Thank you for that. I want you guys to know how much God loves you. And I I love the fact that my church is all in for the next gen because that's the heart of God. God loves people. But it seems to me like if you read the Bible the way I do, God has a big heart for young people. In fact, I think God's people, because of God's heart, are always prioritizing reaching and teaching and unleashing the next generation. And in our culture, we even have songs about this. Uh, I don't know if you remember uh, uh, Whitney Houston's song that, that began with this lyric. The lyric was by a lady named Linda Creed, but here's, here's the song. I believe the children are our future. Remember that? Teach them well and let them lead the way. Now, that lyric was written in 1976. Whitney Houston came a little after that. And, and so it, for those of you who raised your hands, you won't even know what I'm talking about. But I love this line. Our children are our future. That's what this message is about. Our church has a heart for the future because our church has a heart for the next generation. And this is God's way. In fact, when God was creating the nation of Israel, when he led people out of bondage in Egypt, uh, 
there's this book in the Old Testament called Deuteronomy. It's, it's Moses recounting God's way for the, for the culture, God's way for the nation. And in Deuteronomy chapter 6, we, we kind of find the, the national anthem of Israel, the, the sort of the constitution, the founding statement. Do, do you know what it is? Uh, Deuteronomy 6 says this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God. There it is. From the very beginning, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. Loving God, nothing matters more. That was true in ancient Israel. That's true for us today. And and then, then Moses says this. These commands that I give you, God says this. They're to be internalized. They're to be on your hearts. And here's how you do that. You start young because the next thing the Scripture says is impress them on your children. Impress them on your children. From time to time, I'll meet parents or other adults who say, I I don't believe I should force faith on my kids. Uh, You know, we should let our kids grow up and make their own choices. And Moses hears that, and you know what Moses says? Fooey. It's Hebrew. Fooey. That's just stupid. I mean, here's God saying, If we don't teach our children, who will? Our children are being impressed all the time. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you you walk along the road. Talk about when you lie down. Talk about when you get up. In fact, these scriptures, these commands of mine, tie them as symbols on your hands. Put them on your foreheads. Write them on the the door frames of your houses and on the gates. Now, what's this mean? Well, our hands are what we use to, to do work with. So let God's principles, God's commands, God's word guide your behavior. Let God's word guide your thinking, your head. Let God's word guide what happens in your house. Let God's word guide and and direct what happens when you leave your house. Impress them on your children. Kids matter. And ancient Israel got it. William Barclay says, no nation has ever set the child in their midst more deliberately than the Jews did. They valued children. They taught children. They loved children. They impressed the way of God on their children. You've heard the same jokes I have about Jewish mothers, haven't you, and how engaged they were in kids. It's because God wants that. In fact, Asaph in Psalm 78 has an amazing thing to say. He said, "My, my people, listen to my instructions. Open your ears to what I'm saying for I, I'm going to speak to you in a parable. I'm going to tell you a story, in other words. I want to teach you lessons, hidden lessons from our past, stories which we have heard, we know, stories that have to be passed on, stories that our ancestors handed down to us. You're getting the picture here? Asaph said there is a continuity to faith that requires generational storytelling. In fact, he says, we will not hide these truths from our children. We will tell the next generation of the glorious deeds of the Lord and his power and his mighty wonders. For he, he's issued his laws to Jacob. He has given his instructions to to Israel. He commanded our ancestors to teach them to their children, teach them to their children, teach them to their children so that the next generation might know. (laughs) Even children who haven't been conceived yet, haven't been born yet, that they will in turn teach their own children. Are you getting the picture here? The way of God in ancient Israel was for one generation to teach the next the ways of faith. That's still God's desire. So each generation should set its hope anew on God, not forgetting his glorious miracles and obeying his commands. So faith is to to be passed on. (coughs) Excuse me. Sum it up with this. Tell the next generation about the glorious deeds of the Lord, about who he is, about his mighty power, about his wonderful, wonderful works. And, of course, that culminates in in Jesus. Are you getting the picture here? We have an obligation to be the next link in the chain of faith. I've done some ancestry research in my life, genealogical research. One of the things I was surprised to discover was that a thousand years ago in my family there was a man who was planting churches and living for Jesus as best he understood it. Do you know what that meant to me? In my family, faith has been a real thing for a millennium. How about in yours? Are you the beginning of a generational burst of faith in your family lineage? Or are you the continuation of what's been passed down from you 
Either way, God says, invest in the next generation. Pass along faith to them. You say, well, Jeff, that's the Old Testament. What about the New Testament? Well, can I tell you, Jesus kind of continues the same theme. He prioritizes kids. He, he loves kids. Do you ever think about what makes Jesus angry? What made him mad? Remember in the temple when all the, the money changers were there and they were cheating people when they came to worship and God's uh, house was to be a place of prayer and it had become a, just a pocket of thieves? You remember what Jesus did? He threw over the tables and he chased people out with a whip. He was pretty ticked. But Jesus got mad on another occasion. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant. Do you ever wonder what ticks Jesus off? I don't want to do that. How about you? I mean, what makes Jesus angry? I'll tell you what it was. It was his disciples who were preventing children from getting close to him. He was indignant, and the next thing he says was, let the little children come to me. Don't hinder them. The kingdom of God belongs to such as these. And truly, I tell you, anyone who does not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will not enter it. Jesus said, we got a lot to learn from these kids, and they have value. Don't ever be an obstacle between Jesus and the next generation. Man, that's what I'm learning. That ticks Jesus off. Are you an obstacle for young people? Finding and following Jesus, meeting and surrendering to King Jesus. That was not Jesus' attitude. In fact, whenever he met children, he loved them, he blessed them. He, he took the children in his arms. He, he placed his hands on them. He, he blessed them. Jesus loves and values the next generation. We should follow in his steps. So should we. And guess what we do? We do. The challenge is just to introduce the next generation to Jesus. How can you and I do our part to make Jesus known to the children in our lives, to the young people in our lives, to, to the next generation? Well, let me give you some suggestions today, just things that are common sense and things I see, again, in Scripture. One way to invest in the future, uh, invest in, in the next generation, is to start early. Start early. When kids are very little, people brought little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them and pray. Them. The word here in Greek is paideia, and it, it means a, a, a child of indeterminate age, but, but certainly no more than six or eight or ten, uh, all the way down to newborn. But also, there's a word for babies. <laughs> people were bringing babies to Jesus for his to place his hands on them. So, Here's the example of Jesus. He starts loving these kids, interacting with these kids, engaging with these kids early, early, early. And we should teach our children to do the same thing. As early as we possibly can, let's get them close to Jesus. Let's introduce them to Jesus. Start early. Another thing, we should expect opposition. Now, the opposition that Jesus encountered came from a surprising source at first. The disciples were the obstacles. I mean, the disciples rebuke these people who are trying to get their kids close to Jesus. I mean, and I have met people like that, people who said, why are we pouring so much money and time into those kids at church? You ever heard anybody say that? You know, they're expensive. Why are they going on these trips? Why, you know, look at our campus. You know, we have a wonderful room here. We have a wonderful lobby. We have some offices in the back. We have an upper level. But, but you know that there's 12,000 square feet dedicated to children and young people on the, the bottom level of this building. Now, that money, that, that costs some money to build. In fact, the 12,000 square feet on our lower level is larger than the church building we left over on Branch Hill. Why are we investing money for space, money for staff? We've got, we've got at least six people on staff who are devoted to young people in our two campuses. Why? Because they matter to God. And they matter to us. I love my church because we love children. We love young people. Now, expect opposition. Sometimes people can be the obstacle. But can I tell you, every generation grows up in a different world. Isn't that true? I mean, the world our kids are inheriting is very different than the one I inherited where every woman in foster was my mama. That's no longer true. You know, it's different music, different, different uh, 
different culture, different standards, different principles of, uh, of behavior in the world. And there are some shaping influences that a, a psychologist who studies generations at, at San Diego State University, a, a, a very renowned woman named Jean Twiggy, said there are six shaping influences for our children today. Do, do you know, want to know what they are? Because every one of them is both an obstacle and an opportunity. One of the things that shapes our kids today is the internet. Would you agree with that? Big shaping influence on our kids today. Now, let me tell you, I am a digital pioneer. I'm happy to announce and proud to say that my generation invented the internet. Even Al Gore apparently had a hand in it. You know, uh, so I am a digital pioneer. So are you. You know, we, we all use some measure of tech. We may like the internet. We may surf the internet. We may be comfortable in the internet. But listen, our children, they're natives to the internet. Life for them happens on the internet internet how many how many people 25 and down do you know that own an alarm clock well maybe somebody does i don't know them what that's what your phone is for right how many how many people 25 and down do you know want to go to the mall to connect with friends because you don't connect with your friends at the mall malls are dying you connect with your friends where on your phone how many how many people 25 and down my grandkids you know we'll go out to eat They'll text me sitting across the table. You know, because they're natives to the Internet. And that is both a wonderful tool and a horrible, horrible burden. More on that in a moment. Uh, this generation, one of the, the things that they are is independent. You know, our, our generation, you know, had some pretty staunch opinions about lots of things. But in younger people today, 20s and down, you, you'll, you'll be hard-pressed to find a, you know, a really rabid Democrat or a really, what are Republicans, red, blue? I can't remember. Whatever, you know, you, you just don't find people with those hard lines anymore. Uh, they're not, they're, they're more independent. They're more willing to cross lines and, and move in all kinds of circles. They're inclusive you know, I, I listened to an, uh, an interview on the way in with uh, an LGBTQ spokesperson, and I, I love hearing these things because I want to learn, I want to understand. But one of the things I took away from that interview was that, boy, we live in a world where feelings reign supreme. That, you know, the, the goal is to affirm everybody's feelings. Now, the only problem with that is that sometimes feelings can't be trusted. But we live in a world where nobody wants to hurt anybody's feelings. So, yes, you can be part. Yes, you can be. Everybody's, everybody's welcome. And so sometimes inclusiveness means that our kids aren't very discriminating when it comes to maybe some boundaries that are appropriate and important to God. Another thing that's true that this children, uh, our, our younger generation, our next generation is in no hurry. Now, can I tell you, growing up in Foster, Kentucky, not only had the advantage of being protected in that little community, it had the advantage of I was driving before I had a license. You can't do that today, or I suppose you can, but I don't see it happening, you know. I drove my family through Chicago when I was 14 years old because my parents didn't want to drive in the city. Seriously, it happened. And, you know, but today... I know 18, 19, or 20-year-olds that don't have a license. You know, they're in no hurry. Our parents, our grandparents, they were married by average 19 years of age. Started having kids instantly. You know, today, nobody's in a hurry to get married. In fact, at 25, you're just finishing grad school. You may get married in your late 20s. You may have a child by 30, but not uncommon for kids to be coming in their late 30s and beyond now in no hurry another thing about the next generation is that they are insecure now every generation is so i'm not picking on anybody and not everybody has all these characteristics but listen do you know one of the reasons people are so insecure at the next generation is because of the internet you know when we were in school when i was in school at any rate the only time you had to worry about any kind of potential bullying was eight to four from the time you got on the bus to the time you got off and after that, you're pretty much on your own. You, you know, nobody was picking on you. You know, with the Internet, kids are being picked on 24-7 now. They're being chased and abused and ridiculed and called out and 
And there's a lot of insecurity in our children. If we're not aware of this. We, we're just burying our head in the sands. Another thing about this generation is that they are largely irreligious. You know, I grew up in a culture where even people who really weren't trusting and following Jesus knew about him. But today's generation, many of them never even heard of Jesus. I recently had a conversation with a 76-year-old, highly successful retired professional in the UK, and I was surprised when he asked me, who is Jesus? I don't know anything about Jesus. That's rare for somebody of that generation. It's common for our children and their friends to know very little about Jesus. Did you see the, the question, you know, what's the blank? What, what's is it jeopardy, the category? Our Father in heaven, blank be thy name. Did you, did you catch that a couple weeks ago? Nobody knew the answer. Three contestants, nobody knew the word that completed the first line of the Lord's Prayer. That's today's generation of, of followers who are coming behind us. And so there, there's going to be opposition in this world to the things of faith, but there's also opportunity in every one of these things because it means there's a wide open spirit to the gospel. Uh, one other thing I want to say here is when it, when it comes to introducing kids to Jesus, don't condescend. Don't condescend. Love them. Uh, Jesus said it like this. See that you do not despise one of these little ones. Don't look down on them. Don't belittle them. Don't, don't think they're less than or more than. In fact, Jesus called the little children and said, let them come to me. Don't hinder them. Don't hinder them. Don't hinder them. Don't be in the way by attitude or action. Uh, one final thing. Be persistent. Be persistent in this. If we're going to overcome the way of the world and the, 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 if we're going to swim against the stream of our culture, then we need to go all the way back to Deuteronomy. And again, this was so important. Moses said it a second time. Teach your children, talking about, to them when you, when you sit at home, when, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, when you get up, you know, in, in the context of your family, in every moment of every day, engage your kids with Jesus. In fact, I think the best way to do this, not just to talk about it, but we have to live it as well. Show the next generation your love for Jesus. Now, I'm grateful for our church. None of us are perfect here. But I've seen over and over and over and over your behavior be an example worth following. And I'm grateful for that. And I want to challenge you. Be an example worth following. Are you a disciple worth reproducing? Because the people who are going to look at you most are the people closest to us, the, the young people in your life. Be an example of faith worth emulating. This is how Paul spoke to Timothy. He said, you had some great examples, Timothy. I remember your genuine faith because it's a faith that then I saw it in Lois, your grandma. Then I saw it in your mama, Eunice. And now I see that faith in you. There's a, an example, a heritage of faith. Pass it along. And how about this? Parents, don't be hard on your children. Raise them properly. Teach them and instruct them about the Lord. So we can't be passive in this. God calls us to engage the future by engaging our children, by engaging the next generation. And God's dream for River Hills is that we always be a church that, that cares for, that loves, that introduces the next generation to Jesus. And this is our church. We do this over and over again. Now, let me tell you something. When you're persistent, no church can counteract the culture by just what happens on the weekend or special events. The ministry of our church with regard to children is designed to help parents and grandparents be great grandparents and great parents every day. Why is this important? There are about 2 billion children on earth under the age of 15, and they are the largest unreached people group in the world. And boys and girls are open and receptive to Jesus if we're willing to share Jesus. And the older we go, sometimes the harder it becomes to cross that line of faith. So let's strike while the iron is hot. And I'm happy to announce at River Hills, we invest in the next generation. I've mentioned some ways we do that. But you know what? The question is not do we do it. The question is, are you doing it? What are you doing to build the future? by investing in the young people in your life. 
I want to ask the Holy Spirit right now to speak to you because my guess is there is a, a niece or a nephew or maybe it's a son or a daughter, a grandchild, a, a neighbor kid, somebody that you know and you could just love on them a little more than you have. You could be a little more courageous about pointing to Jesus than you have. Wouldn't that be a great thing if you did that? So I want to invite you to join me now, and let's just pray that God would give us his heart for the future. And that means his heart for the next generation. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we come and we bow down before you, and we ask you, Lord, to fill us with your spirit. Father, there is a need in our hearts, Lord, to grow. And Father, we know that won't happen unless we trust you, Lord, unless we follow you, unless we yield to you. And so, God, we do that now. And Heavenly Father, I pray, would you touch our hearts for, for kids, for young adults, for teens? God, help us to love the next generation and to love them really well. Thank you, God, that we're a group of people, a church that does this. And Lord, it's just one more reason. I love your kingdom. I love your people. God, I love my church because you've given us your heart for kids. Fertilize that, God, and let it grow in all of us. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, teenagers can be hard to love. They're hormonally insane mentally challenged young people can be hard to love because they're just so needy so demanding babies are so totally dependent easy to love usually but still very draining young adults can be hard to love kind of like older adults like you and me people are always a challenge but God wants us to love really well and he certainly loves us more than we've ever imagined. Just look at the cross one more time and figure that out. God loved us so much that he gave his one and only son on the cross. He invested in us by allowing his son to be sacrificed so that we may be blessed, so that, me, that we may have the Holy Spirit in us. Every week, we recognize that through communion. We experience communion together as a church. And the couple that's in front of you, and maybe you grab them coming in, are the elements of communion. Let's take those now. Let's peel back the, the first tab, which represents his body. He suffered and died for us so that we could be forever with him, so that we could connect with him on a weekly basis, so that we can know that we are saved, so that we can remember what he did for us, how he invested in us. So let's take that bread together. And the grape juice represents his blood that was poured out for us so that we may have everlasting life. Again, a sacrifice for us, an investment in us in all humanity, that we could have that perfect relationship with Christ because we can't do it on our own. So let's take that juice together and then pray and remember what Christ did for you on the cross.
Let's all stand and praise him.
And Father, we are available to you. You've blessed us so much. You've given us such a huge investment by giving us Jesus Christ, his body and his blood, so that we may be forever with you. Lord, we want to reach others for you. We want to impact future generations because they need it. We know that they need it. Never before has the future generation had so much pulling against it away from you. That's why we need as many people as we can investing in the next generations, Lord. Lord, just help us, guide us, lead us to how you want us to impact others. Lord, we love you. We praise you. We thank you for this message. We thank you for everyone in this room. Please bless them. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Hey, we're so thankful that you're here this morning. We hope this was a great service for you. We have prayer partners that if you want to stay seated in your seats, they'll come out and pray with you. And uh, remember, we've got volunteer opportunities in the lobby. So many opportunities that we'd love to have you get involved. If you want to get involved, there are forms to fill out. Hopefully you can turn those in. If you did not get a form, please visit one of the tables out there. Thank you and have a blessed week.